So, so again, welcome to the Lanning Lecture Series. Uh, this lecture series was established in 1988 by Jack Dillon. Uh, Jack was a civil engineering graduate who got his bachelor's degree in 1941, and he established this lecture series in honor of his late wife, Frances Lanning Dillon. Um, he established the lecture series to provide an opportunity to broaden students' experience beyond the technical engineering aspects that you get in classes to look at other professional characteristics, such as the societal, culture, and economic impacts of decisions that we make. Um, he was also interested in ethics and in leadership. And I think our speakers today are, are really great examples of individuals that can speak to these characteristics. It's my honor to introduce today's Lanning Lecture speakers. As professors at WSU from 1993 to 2015, Sankar and Uma J. Uma J. Raman uh, were pioneer researchers and in today's virtual reality technology. Uh, the JROMs established the Virtual Reality Computer Integrated Mach Manufacturing Laboratory here at WSU, as well as several virtual reality companies, including Integrated Engineering Solutions, Translation Technologies, and Voke VR, which was sold to Intel in 2016. Their work with Intel currently recently culminated in the first Olympic experience um, using virtual reality at the 2018 Winter Olympics. So uh, through their technology, millions of people from around the world were able to experience what it was like to really be at the Olympics and feel, feel those activities up close. And to think the technology that we're talking about was first used at a sporting event here in Martin Stadium for WSU football. Through their groundbreaking innovations, fans have been able to watch concerts, soccer matches, and other sporting events around the world. But sporting events are not the only thing that the technology is important for. Um, companies such as Packard and Caterpillar Kumatsu, the National Science Foundation, DARPA, NASA, they all saw the potential of this technology and they supported the research activities for um, our speakers and their graduate students. The work looked at streamlining manufacturing and things like immersive first first aid and first responder training. So, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what it was like to see it at a sporting event, but imagine using this technology for all kinds of other activities. <coughs> Our WSU students were also very positively impacted by this technology. They benefited from the exposure of the technology and research while here at WSU, and many of them have gone on to work at VOC and Intel today. For their innovation, Sports Business mag Magazine named Jay as one of the top idea innovators. And both Uma and Jay are fellows of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And Uma received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society of Agile Manufacturing. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome back to WSU, the Chief Technology Officer of Intel Sports and the Managing Director of Engineering at Intel True VR, Jay and Uma J. Raman. So. Mary, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces uh, in the audience, uh, especially wonderful to see our colleagues from the Mechanical Engineering Department, our friends from the community, and for those of you who are here for the Common Reading Program, I assure you it will be fun, you'll get through it, and you <laughs> will get your credit, and hopefully you will enjoy, or enjoy the talk here. Uh, what we will do is, um, you know, I'm kind of projecting my voice here. You see me, um, you know, mic'd up, but that's actually for the 
uh, I guess for some of the recording. So in case you're wondering why you don't hear me louder through the microphone, I just wanted to make sure you understood what was going on and hopefully you all can hear us. Um, as Jay and I were uh, you know, driving from Spokane Tuesday night, it was almost close to midnight and we were driving to Pullman, we were reflecting on how many maybe hundreds of times we had made that trip. And uh, you know, starting with our kids being tiny and you know, all the way to now us coming back. And um, it, it really is like coming home and um, lovely memories. And uh, you know, we are so honored to be here and to share some of our experiences. Uh, we have a number of stories to share with you, some of our technologies that we want to um, you know, just, ju ju just bring in front of you. And so without much ado, I just want to uh, you know, start on st with some of our stories. And like all stories, it's, you know, this one starts uh, you know, with a once upon a time in a land far away. And so this is essentially <laughs> <laughs> WSU, the early years. Now, I want to ask all of you a question here, OK? And please humor me. If you have a cell phone in your pocket, and I see Kirk putting his back in his coat <laughs> pocket, but what I would like is if you have a cell phone, please take it out and hold it up. OK, and I think everyone here, right? Everyone here has one. Thank you. Please put it back. What I want to say is when we came to Pullman in 93, there was no Wi-Fi. There was no cell phone. OK, but what we did have is possibly the desktop computers. So I wanted to put that in the perspective of the time frame. If I just say 93, it really doesn't mean much. But we didn't have these devices. And we started the VR lab in 94. So it's in that context, uh, you know, we just felt that this was something we wanted to do and uh, formed the VR lab and used it more for the engineering, uh, to solve the engineering problems. So here we are uh, in 2018 and wanted to talk to you a little bit about the journey and what were some of the uh, accomplishments in terms of what was done with the technology. Thanks, Uma. Uh, it really is an honor to be here. I've attended landing lectures before and marveled at the speakers and can't believe that I'm on this side. Um, I want to start off by talking about the journey of virtual reality, where it all started. Um, we came to WSU. Uma was teaching over in University of Idaho for one year before she moved to WSU. I was going to work in artificial intelligence and through a chance discussion with somebody at Ford, I decided, oh, maybe I should do virtual reality. That's how things, things get started. And here's a picture of my first virtual reality device. This was 1993. Um, it was uh, November, and uh, our board member from Packard Technical Center, Gail Lees, was uh, visiting um, WSU and Steven Tolovich made an introduction and before she came we uh, did a little bit of research and saw how much they do prototyping of trucks for ergonomics and we said you know what we should be able to put on a headset and is this advancing on its own uh, we should put we should be able to put on a headset and be able to um, see the truck before it is built before you ever build a physical prototype and given that concept we wanted to um, show them what it is, and virtually it did not really exist. So I went to Walmart, bought a little Viewmaster, took a saw, cut it in half, put two spinning cubes in computer graphics on, the, on a big CRT monitor, taped it with scotch tape around the Viewmaster, and put your head in, and I was like, whoa, you can see this in 3D. And that's what I showed. I actually had the, the person visiting from Packard stick her face up against that monitor and said, you should be looking at your trucks this way. That's where it started. Got the first round of funding. Uh, Reed was supporting at that time uh, from the dean's office, and, uh, and we uh, got our virtual reality lab going. You can see that headset that we built to support that activity. We called it the big, that's about this big, six pounds. We had to put lead counterweight so we could lift our head. <laughs> Other than it's too heavy in the front. <laughs> lead was an OK thing at that time to use. <laughs> 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 that's how long ago this was. 
but we had full body tracking, we were doing ergonomics of trucks, we had augmented reality, we had merged, merged reality, all kinds of different things that, uh, that we were already doing back in 1993. Then fast forward a few years, uh, we started a company uh, that we called 3D4U. And 3D4U uh, we created as a concept of allowing people to use virtual reality to visit remote locations. And we were thinking, oh, you want to go to the Smithsonian? You should be able to put on a headset and walk through the Smithsonian. You get on a treadmill in the gym, and uh, you can be jogging in the Alps, or get on a bicycle and go on Tour de France. And using that concept, we started thinking about how do we capture reality with videos, with images, and put people into that. And at that time, 3D was gaining a little bit of popularity, so we said, no, we call it 3D for you. And as we started going through that process, we realized that the business side of it, when you're doing this as a company, was very difficult. How do you distribute the data? Internet still wasn't there that big. This, this is you know, early 2000s. And you're looking at transmitting gigabytes of data to people, it's not possible. So you make CDs and discs, you sell it at Walmart and Best Buy and other places, so people can put it in their PlayStation, and then they have to have these headsets which didn't really exist, they cost, they cost $2,000. You package a bundle of headset and CDs, the distribution cost was too high, the business just wasn't working out. And being a football fan, I still remember this, uh, the story of walking out of Safeway with bags in my hand, I was missing a Seahawks game, and uh, our business partner from Virginia, our co-founder, he, he called and I said, we can talk later, I'm missing a Seahawks game, I want to go back home, catch that game, I said, it would, have, it would be really cool if we could use virtual reality to actually put people in the stadium. I would love to be in the Seahawks stadium, and right there was that, wait, we are thinking about this all wrong. Forget about visiting the Smithsonian, let's put people in stadiums. And his first question was, what, can we do that? Can we do that real time? How will that work? And I said, we'll figure that out. But that's where we're gonna go, right? So that's where, you know, as a small company, you start making those pivots and say, okay, that's what we're gonna do. Well, we went and created a sample. We went and uh, filmed a museum. We went and filmed an, an NBA game. It took us 30 days to prepare a two minute demo of what it would be like. You know, forget about real time. Right? It's 30 days for, for a two minute video, is what it took. When we recorded the video, everything was upside down. We didn't even have technology to flip the video straight side up while recording. Okay, that, you know, so people are looking at images upside down while, while it's being recorded. So we went through all that and then fast forward a few more years and we managed to get that to a point where we were able to do that in real time. And what that meant was, at that time, there were no headsets. 3D TVs were coming along and Martin Stadium was being renovated, and uh, we met with uh, President Floyd, he visited our company out in the research park, and uh, um, it was June, and halfway through my presentation, I had a couple of people outside throwing frisbees, and we was, he was inside, we had a big 3D TV screen and 3D glasses, and he had this little joystick I, could, I gave him so he could, he could look around and zoom in on people and things like that, and Halfway through, he got on his phone, and I stopped talking. And I thought this was pretty rude, you know. He's on the phone while I'm making a presentation. He hung up, and then I continued talking. He said, Jay, sit down. I'm already sold. I, there, I was on the phone with the athletics department. I called the football head coach and football assistant coaches to come here right now. So that was June, and he brought the athletics department. Within half hour, we had a, about 12 people out there. And he said, I want this in the stadium. Next season? No, this season. Okay, we'll get it in before, you know, end of the season sometime. No, I want it for first game, and he walked out. I swear those people were ready to kill me. <laughs> they, they were already putting sheetrock in the suites, and now we're going to introduce a brand new technology in the stadium that he just saw. Um, those three months were intense. We had never done live streaming of sports of any kind. I just showed a demo of people throwing Frisbee outside with, a, with one camera that we had created, and now we were supposed to put six, four, five, six cameras in the stadium, live stream to every suite. We don't even know how we're gonna to stream to so many TVs at the same time. 
and we had to build the cameras. We had to get the software ready. So those three months were intense. September 7th, first game, we were live. And uh, we had all the 3D TVs um, in every suite. They actually had to cut the sheetrock, put new cable for us for the 3D TVs. They upgraded all the TVs to 3D TVs. John Johnson, who was the associate athletic director, I don't see him here today. He probably doesn't want to relive that nightmare. <laughs> he, he was responsible for getting the stadium ready in time. And the night before, I mean, we are out there checking our systems. People are still painting the walls. Next day, the games, you know, people are going to be in the suites and they're painting and, and putting fans to get this paint order out. That's how tight it was. I don't know how he pulled it off, but he was amazing. So, we, so WSC was the first place. And you see the images here. Uh, there's the camera up on top. Uh, and every suite had this game controller. Uh, this was uh, Dwayne Brelsworth's suite up there. Uh, he and his kids and their family, they were amazing users. They were on the system all the time and so much energy. And there were all kinds of kids who were re really enjoying the technology. So that was our introduction to, hey, we can do live sports. We can stream it in. Now it is all 3D TV. So going from there, the following year, we realized that 3D TVs are kind of going downhill, not catching on. By the time mobile phones were taking off, and everybody was carrying mobile phones around, everybody was carrying tablets around, and we were like, let's take our technology, put it on mobile phones. You don't have to have a TV. You can have a mobile phone, you can swipe, and you can pan, and you can look around, and you get the same level of control on mobile phones. So we put up this booth in the stadium to show people what it was. We created an app. And we had all the suites with the Wi-Fi available. And the, um, all, the, all the folks in the suites were able to experience that now sitting watching the game. And you would see an instant replay, hit the button, go back, and you can go back, zoom in, and look at it from different camera angles. So that we put in there in the second year and third year. Interestingly enough, um, we were looking at this concept. We were also looking at what else could we do with this. We could do concerts. Life takes you in many different journeys. Uh, we had, for some reason, uh, Puerto Rico it seemed to be a good thing for us. We ended up with Mark Anthony on our board of directors. And he helped us uh, with a couple of concerts. Those of you who don't know Mark Anthony, he's called the king of salsa. And uh, he's better known as the ex-husband of Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, and I have met him and been to his home and met his kids. And he, he told his kids, you see this on the TV? This is how you kids are going to be watching events in the future with this game controller. So he was a visionary. He saw that. He wanted to be on our board. He helped us. Then we met with Ricky Martin. They wanted to do a concert. We actually did a concert with Ricky Martin. And that was our first public app that we published of his concert in Sydney. So we're looking at how do we take this past, because once you get to the sports, you're, you, we were stuck to stadiums. The rights management in sports is enormous. People don't have rights to take today's game and show it tomorrow unless you are this or that, and you have 24 hours, and they, they have 48 hours. You have it next week. When you put the whole package together, you're kind of stuck to teams and stadiums, and you cannot get it to people all over the, you know, all over the country or the world or wherever you want to send it. Concerts were a little easier. So he said, OK, let's go try concerts. And we were doing all that. And then suddenly, 2014 happened. What happened? Oculus got bought by Facebook for $2 billion. Nobody knew virtual reality at that time. Virtual reality was something we did in the labs in 95, 96, 2000. Everybody forgot about it. 14 years later, suddenly, Facebook decides that they want to get into virtual reality. Suddenly, virtual reality is a craze, right? Everybody's talking about Facebook buying Oculus and $2 billion, and the world's going to change, and virtual reality, and you're like, OK, we're OK with that. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> we, we know what to do with that. But then you know, interesting things start happening when, when something like that happens. So we started getting a little bit more traction. So we went back. It was very interesting because we started with headsets. Nobody wanted to use headsets. 3D TVs were big, so we put it on 3D TVs. 3D TVs are going away. We put it on mobile devices. Oculus gets bought by Facebook. People are asking us, oh, can you put this on headsets? <laughs> <laughs> We're like, yeah, which one? Pick yeah. <laughs> 93, 95, 97, 2000, 2005, 2010. Which headset do you want? Right? So literally overnight, once we got the Oculus device, we got it one morning. Next day I was going to New York. 
And that one evening, we ported our entire system to the Oculus headset, and I took to New York and did a demo in 24 hours. We had a guy who was flying back from somewhere. I had somebody go to the airport, pick him up from the airport at 11.30, bring him to the office, John Harrison. And he and I worked through the night, got it done, and, we, and I flew out there. So then we were at the Jaguars, you know, in, the, in, in a uh, fan cave area that they had. Uh, we were doing soccer in Europe. We were all over trying to say, OK, we need some traction. Come on, guys. You know, we, virtual reality is getting big. Sports is big. We should be able to do this. We even went to the Olympics. Uma and I, that's us at the Olympics when we were a 10-person company. They liked what we were doing. They said, yeah, but you know, small 10-person company, you're not based in Silicon Valley. You know, I don't think you guys can pull off the Olympics. Right? So we walked away saying, OK, you know, we gave it a shot. And then we noticed there was money starting to pour in into virtual reality. The venture capitalists in Silicon Valley started putting money in. As soon as that started happening, it became a race. There were companies that were getting funded. We suddenly hear of this company, John. John doing virtual reality and movies in virtual reality. And we're like, yeah, we have done that 10 years ago. And they just got $10 million from so-and-so. Whoa. OK, that's serious competition. Now what do we do? Then another company comes up. And then another company comes up. We're like, oh my god, <laughs> this is becoming a race. What do we do? Then we realize that we have to change our tactics a little bit. Now you have to play the game a little different. You have to go to Silicon Valley. So we are in Pullman. We started flying. So we would set up meetings, go there, have a day full of meetings, come back. And next meeting, you get three months later. By the time they've forgotten, oh, by the way, who are you? What were you doing? What did we talk about last time? Out of sight, out of mind. They get 100, 150, 200 really good technology proposals every day. So they, and they have to pick and choose what they find. So unless you are in their face, constantly in that iteration, you know, you're not going to get any funding. You're not going to get the support. And now you have competition that's really well funded. They are creating trucks to do virtual reality and so on and so forth. And we are still this 10, 12 person company huffing and puffing, saying, we have been doing this for a long time. We are running this race for a long time. You need to be there. And once you go through that process, then suddenly, you know, then you get that break that you're looking for. Um, we rebranded, renamed our company. The company that helped us rename our company, that company's name was 100 Monkeys. And Uma picked that company. I was like, are you sure you, a company that's called 100 Monkeys is going to pick our name? <laughs> <laughs> How is that going to work? <laughs> but guess what? I never forgot that name. 100, yeah. 100 Monkeys is a name that stuck with me, right? So they helped us pick this name, Vogue. We rebranded ourselves. And we, did, uh, we got our first break, which was March Madness. We had got a deal with Turner Sports, NCAA, to stream March Madness live in 2016 to people at home through Oculus. And so we had a partnership with Oculus, partnership with Turner Sports, partnership with NCAA, 12 people in Pullman <laughs> responsible for that whole thing. Okay? One person from Milwaukee, our business development guy who was very well known in, in sports. He, you know, he, was, um, he, he knew the right people to connect and everything else. And so we got that break. Same time, we got an opportunity to do something with Sacramento Kings. So we streamed a game live for them. Hey, straight up. <laughs> we, 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 streamed, we streamed a game for them live all the way to Mumbai to their owner's hometown school where we had 12 kids in headsets watching the game live from a courtside seat. When that break happened, that's what people want to see. Can you really scale? You say you have good technology. Can you really scale? Can you get it to people's homes? Can, you, can it go to tens of thousands of people instead of 100 people in the stadium? That was what gave us an opportunity to scale. And that was our break that we needed. And immediately after that happened, Intel funded us with a series of financing which they brought in other people as, as they normally do. Six months later, we were part of Intel. And what was Vogue was now Intel Inside. And so that was our journey from the sort of Viewmaster stuck with Scotch tape on a big CRT monitor. And 21 years later, or 24 years later, you know, finally things caught up with us. 
and we caught up with everything else, and we ended up at Intel. So what are we doing at Intel? So let me pass it off to Uma here, and she'll walk us through Intel and through to the Olympics. I guess these slides have a mind of their own. They're kind of advancing. And so apologize that you know we're kind of keeping an eye on that. Yeah. Um, so essentially, as Jay said, uh, we are now part of Intel. And uh, you know the rebranding, we were talking to some students earlier, the importance of name. And so we went from 3 d for You to Vogue. And once we were part of Intel, then they kind of wanted a different name. Uh, you know, you kind of want to get into the stream of Intel products and the uh, brand architecture. And so we became uh, true v Intel True VR. What I'd like to share with you next is a video by our um, CEO. Uh, he, he goes by BK. And this was a presentation. Let's begin with our view of an incredible data-driven experience. So let's begin with our view of an incredible data-driven experience that we call immersive media. The data has moved far beyond what it will call technical calculation and computation. It's become a life force of creativity. And one of the most exciting non-traditional uses of data is its role in the creation of this immersive media. It's going to transform the consumer experience in almost every area, retail, travel, advertising, entertainment, education, even medicine. But the real opportunity is to use data to produce and deliver the most immersive, realistic content possible. And this was the missing piece. You're going to see here this week a lot of great hardware products on the market that enable the VR experience. But without the most compelling content, those devices will never live up to their potential. We realized that creating and delivering this content could only be done by solving a massive computing problem. And that's exactly what we do at Intel. And I want to show you how we use our expertise to deliver this immersive media tonight. And this breakthrough combines artificial intelligence, advanced camera technology, and millions of HD images to blur the lines between reality and imagination to create something known as volumetric video. So now let me give you some insight into how this all works, because it comes in a variety of flavors. Within Intel, for instance, we have several different technologies that enable the creation of immersive experiences. One of those technologies is Intel True VR which is already making an impact in sports globally and will continue to transform fan experiences. It also extends beyond sports and will increasingly affect how consumers will interact with the content in all kinds of experiences. And I decided that it was best to have BK talk about true VR and how that's being used. And so we used this little video clip here. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about the technology and so what we do is essentially allow you to view the game from a vantage point that works for you. And so as you look at this video, you're seeing that there is the ability to really pick the best seat in the house. And that's what this technology allows you to do. How do we do it? We have our own uh, patented uh, camera technology. That's where it starts. And so you can either have a 180 or a 360 camera. And we have these pairs of lenses so that you get these stereoscopic pairs of images. And then we go ahead and stitch those. And that is how, th that's where the pipeline starts. And that's how we start the capture process and we are able to deliver. What is the full end-to-end -end solution, right? So essentially, there are five key pieces to this. As I said, it starts with the capture. So we, you know, as we say, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have something good to begin with, you really, you know, there's not much you can do with that. So we make sure that we pay a lot of attention to our capture technology. And then we have the color and stitch technology piece, 
We have the transcoding so that we are sending these out. We're sending it out at multiple bit rates for the uh, headsets. We are sending out a 2D version for the mobile. We sometimes send things out on social media also. And so we have these different versions and different kinds of transcoding going on. We distribute these using the CDN, so something like a level three or an Akamai. Uh, so we had to make sure that our format was compatible with these distribution channels. And then finally, these come home and you have your enabling experiences where you can view it on a VR headset or in 2D on a mobile device. And again, in the VR headsets, we are expanding what we can do. We started out with the Gear VR, and now we have uh, the Google Daydream with the Win MR. And in our roadmap, we have more devices that we will be adding. I also wanted to point out that I showed you the camera, the, 3D, the, the 360 or 180 camera, but essentially we put these camera pods, we call them pods at multiple locations. And so you essentially, those of you who were uh, you know, participating in the viewing in uh, Spark uh, Hall, in the Spark building might have seen, that you can move from location to location, or else there's also what we call a VR cast, which is we have a producer, and the producer is then going ahead and taking the best ones and stringing it together just like you would in a broadcast kind of a situation. So essentially, uh, you know, that's kind of my favorite, so even the dogs watching VR. And so we, uh, you know, have had some good success. What I wanted to point out in this particular slide is how much it takes to produce these events. So we have these big trucks. So when we have these events, just like you have the Turner, the ESPN, their trucks pulling in, you will have an Intel truck pulling in, and then we have our uh, folks uh, with all these screens, uh, information coming in, uh, you know, a lot of VR engineers, uh, essentially making sure that the show happens because you really don't get a second chance, right? Because this is happening in real time and if something messes up, uh, you know, that's it. So um, th this has been really exciting. We've had a number of different uh, places where we've been, number of different events that we've covered. So we, uh, you know, we've done the March Madness. We had a uh, number of uh, executions with the NFL, the NBA. Uh, you know, we've done golf. We love this picture because the guy in the water there, um, he's Blake Rowe, he, he, he's a Coug. He was in my um, ME316 class, uh, interned with us, and then joined, uh, joined our company. And interestingly, uh, within a year, he was the one that actually was the project manager for the full Olympics execution. So he was talking to the folks in, in Spain, talking to OBS, making sure we had all the requirements, making sure that we were delivering on the events. And that was a massive, massive task. And I take great pride that, uh, you know, with the training that he got here through the education system and so on, uh, you know, he, he just handled it, it so well. So in addition, if you're just watching the video stream, I think uh, people will tune out soon because you are used to so many good elements from broadcast, right? You want to know what's the score. You want to see some player profile. Um, you know, you may want to see an ad pop up, you know, whatever it might be. So we, in the last two years, have focused a lot on the experience because the experience is what matters. Really, people don't care, is it VR, not VR, is it immersive? Ultimately, it's like, why, why should I embrace this? Why should I pick up the headset and put it on? And so if, if that is at the cost of losing out elements that they like, you know, that, that's not going to be a good trade-off. So we're trying to bring in these elements that people are used to in broadcast. And so that is, again, a <laughs> workflow of its own. And we've been working with that. You saw the truck and the folks inside that. So we also have production people who are working on getting some of these kinds of graphic uh, elements. Uh, and then we also get like the 
uh, score data, right? That's also coming in, that's getting aggregated. That actually has to be almost at the frame level because you can't be seeing something and then the score data is maybe from uh, you know, a few seconds before and people are seeing that, also watching it on TV. So the whole thing has to really come together so that it's all really, really synchronized. I wanted to also talk about a, a sister technology, another pillar of Intel sports. So we, from Vogue, brought the technology that is now called True VR. The other one, the second pillar, is called True View, and that technology was brought into Intel Sports through a, an acquisition from Israel. And if you watched, say, um, the Super Bowl or something like that, sometimes you'll say it'll say 360 View uh, Intel, and you know they're still rebranding, and now it's it, you'll be seeing it as as True View. So what that does is it's a little different. So ours is inside out, that is outside in. And so in this situation, you have maybe anywhere between 25 to 35 cameras at different vantage points all set up. And then they essentially uh, triangulate and they are able to then create a volumetric rendition of what is happening. And so it's a lot of compute, and that's why Intel is interested, right? Why did Intel get into sports? Yes, sports is exciting, but essentially they feel data is the new oil. And they feel that they really want to be where there is a lot of data that is being processed. And that way, they are in the ecosystem. So here, I just wanted to point out that the volumetric data is essentially being captured through these voxels, many of us. Uh, you know, here at the university, people know what's a voxel, but essentially the pixel is the 2D picture element, and in the voxel, you have the 3D uh, picture, uh, I mean, the, the 3D version of it, right? So you have those 3D elements that are coming together. And essentially what happens is when you have a game, you are capturing this volumetric information. You have these voxels. And how, how does that really help you, right? What, what, what does that do when you have the volumetric information? You're capturing all of this. And then with this, what it allows you to do is you then really have, you have the full model. And now you can have your virtual camera wherever you want. You can then create views from wherever you want, even if there was no actual camera at that point. I, you know, I come from the CAD world, so I think of it as having a CAD model, and then I can slice, dice, do whatever I want with that model. And so that's what they do with the volumetric. And then interestingly, it's a slight variation. When you have the be the player, essentially what it means is if there's a quarterback and you want to see what did the quarterback see at the moment that he threw the pass, you can, it's almost like you have a virtual camera where he is positioned and you can then get that view. So is it all perfect? No. I mean, we are kind of honing it. We are kind of bringing it all together. But this is, this is kind of where we're going. This has been used in uh, you know, sports, even in Europe, La Liga and so on, in addition to the ones here. And uh, for various reasons, I'm not able to show the video to you here because of some rights and so on, but you could always go and look at the 3D highlights and then you would be able to see those. Um, so I mentioned that Intel's interest comes from the fact that there's a lot of data. I mean, that's one of the reasons. And so this gives you an idea for the uh, true view uh, for that uh, execution. The data that they have is that there are three terabytes per minute. And to put that in perspective, it's like you're at the Library of Congress and you have digitized all the books there and that is equivalent to a single football game. And that's where the, you know, that's why Intel is interested in these worlds in addition to the VR and seeing where it goes and also kind of dabbling with, uh, you know, if you're trying to improve a certain technology, you want to have some kind of a stake in the ecosystem, in the applications and so on, and that helps you kind of play in, 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 that, in that sandbox. 
So as was mentioned, uh, you know, just recently in February, we did the first ever uh, Winter Olympics in VR. And so we're very proud uh, that a company that started with its roots here in Pullman uh, was the company that brought this to the world. And um, it was a lot of preparation, a lot of hard work. And finally, that, la that, that first, uh, you know, the opening ceremonies, uh, Jay was in Korea and I was with the team in Santa Clara and it started at about 2.45 in the morning. And so I just uh, had a few team members that were supposed to be there and I reached there at about 1.30 in the morning and the whole team is out there. So we were about 40 of us and um, as always, right, there were some really, really stressful moments uh, where we suddenly something doesn't work and you're like, oh my gosh, six months of hard work and uh, okay do we start looking do we start brushing up our resumes at this point <laughs> but you don't think that far right you just think that we've given it so much love and so much devotion it has to work and sure enough like magic right as it started it was almost like a movie actually right a few minutes before and jay is texting from there to a small group on whatsapp uh, you know our um, general manager james and James is like, Jay, do something. And so we had all this high drama uh, leading up to it, but then the stream started flowing and it, it was just, you know, just really beautiful. And what we take pride is uh, truly we brought this to the world. So we did this, uh, if you think about it, NBC, for example, had rights in the United States. And there were 10, uh, including NBC, there were 10 uh, what are called RHBs, rights holding broadcasters. And Jay talked about the media rights. And that's a completely different aspect of all of this for those of you interested in the business and that part of it. Obviously, you don't just show up with a camera and start doing this. There's a lot of different things that have to be um, negotiated. And I wanted to say that for sure, even in Korea, we don't stop being cooks. And so this is a picture in Korea, in Pyeongchang. And I sent the cougar flag with Jay. And for those of you, you get extra points on your quiz. Um, you know, spot the uh, cougar gold cheese can. And I don't know if you see it, but I, I, don't, I don't want to mess up the pointer, but that's there between Ritesh and Blake on top of the flag. So I sent the cougar gold cheese too, because the team had been there for a while. And uh, it, it definitely did bring and some the, cheer. The lady in the back is an Oregon fan with a thumbs down because we are holding <laughs> a cougar flag. <laughs> so I kind of want to end my piece of it before I hand it back to Jay. And I want to make, be very mindful of the time that uh, through all of this, truly, truly, the joy has been the team. And the way I lead my team in Intel, uh, and, and you know, Jay, I think uh, for sure has the same philosophy, it's people first. And uh, you know, some of you have asked questions about leadership uh, when we met with the students and so on. And truly, I feel uh, you know, people are the biggest treasure, biggest uh, resource. And if you have uh, that team that is, you, know, you have to have the expertise. But beyond that, the right attitude, the right leadership, they all have to come together. Uh, and here, you know, there are a bunch of us from um, you know, we, we, a bunch of the kids we want to show, you know, it's all a family affair. We don't have separation between work and family. You know, we know all the families, the kids, we get together. That was at a Stanford game. The picture on the right top was the last day before we closed down the office here to move to Silicon Valley. And of course, we had to go to Ferdinand's and we all had to have our ice cream there. And then this was, you know, of course, you recognize uh, with Kirk and Noel visiting our office there. And these are all the folks uh, from Pullman and Coogs uh, who are there. And so, you know, that's the picture. This one I'm very proud of. Uh, Young Jun was my first, first or second, a PhD student. And when Jay was in Pyeongchang, he got to know Jay was there. And we had never seen his wife and kids. He drove four hours to go and just see Jay and make sure his wife and kids saw Jay. So that was, uh, you know, that, that was actually amazing. And the person with him is actually my boss now, 
um, Dudi Benuin. He's in Israel. And so it's, uh, it, you know, so my student in Korea, my boss from Israel, Jay, me in Santa Clara. So it's truly a, 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 a you know, kind of a connected global world and workplace. So before we finish up here in the next minute or so, <clears throat> I want to recap the, the journey. So think of 2004 with the WSU helmet that we created. And then there were headsets we could buy for six or $7,000, which is, uh, was in 90, sorry, 94 is when we created the headset. 97, 98, you know, we bought these headsets for six, $7,000 and so on high level of immersion, you feel virtual reality. And then things went down in virtual reality. They became 3D TVs around 2004. We followed the trend and we said, okay, we're going to go 3D TVs. And then it went further down in terms of immersion, but broader acceptance was mobile devices. And then suddenly Oculus happened and you have that upswing on immersive content and you're up there with gamers and headsets and everything else in 2014 to 2018 and beyond. So that's kind of the, the journey that we had to take and follow. The important thing is the core of what we created, the core concept that we are gonna give the fan the, a way to engage the way they want to engage, give them control and give them immersion, played through all of these different scenarios. And then going forward, where does that go? Of course, everybody's gonna be asking about, you know. Ready Player One and the OSS. Are we creating the OSS kind of thing? OSS is computer graphics, right? I can create a computer graphics program or anybody else can and we can put a gaming program and put virtual reality or in the OSS. What is really difficult is being there, standing in the middle of the court and watch Clay Thompson go past you and go and dunk the ball <laughs> while the game is happening. And that is the power of volumetric and virtual reality and everything else that Intel is bringing together. Now, we are not going to create the OSS, but we are going to allow people to be standing in the middle of the court and have people run through you, you know, as you stand there and watch the game. So that's kind of the last slide we had. I want to stop at that and have 60 seconds for questions. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe there oh, are good. some questions. So. Yeah. Chuck? Pleasure to see both of you again. Um, Same here. I would, I, I would like you guys to address to the students about the persistence of vision. Because you guys saw that sometime in the future, this was going to happen. You didn't know when, right? And you're, but how did you manage to maintain that persistence of vision so that when finally the circumstances were right, they were right? From my perspective, be born in May, so you're a Taurus and you're bullheaded, you're not going to give up <laughs> until you get to the end. <laughs> right. Now, the, the, the key is you truly have to believe that this is something that's going to change the world and it's going to happen. And were there times when you know, we were challenged in that persistence? Of course there were. Uh, times when Uma would stay awake night after night saying, how the heck are we going to pay people's paychecks? And they have families and they have mortgages and they have rents. Uh, are we doing the right thing? You know, virtual reality is going away. Oh, no, it's coming back. No, no, there are 3D TVs. Oh, no, TV 3Ds are going away. Oh, we need to go to mobile devices. We can't support so many mobile devices. We have 10 people. Then you go through that. You just have to have that one persistent vision of we know that we're going to create something that fans are going to want. And so you have to hold on to that belief. If you don't have that belief and you don't have the stomach to carry through those ups and downs, don't get into it. Uh, I think but, we could but see get into it clearly. It. We could see it so clearly, and we're like, we see it so clearly. Why can others not see it? Uh, th I think having that, being able to visualize it clearly helps, and definitely just a tenacity and a resilience, really, to not take the rejection personally and to keep going. Yes, yes Rina. What other applications do you see? Okay. Let me ask you. Let, let me ask you a question. What application do you see for video? For video? Yeah. Actually, Just video. Natural calamity. And, and, you, know, you have to think about virtual reality as kind of the next generation of media. 
is the next generation of putting people in places where they cannot be. You watch news today, you get to see the wind blowing the trees down. You're not there. <coughs> You're going to see that. You take that to the next level of, oh my God, that tree is just falling on me, <laughs> right? So news, entertainment, sports, medicine. And interestingly, all of these are things that you've dabbled with along the way, right? Uh, security. Um, you know, we did projects in virtual reality where, you know, you had to train people on devices that they might not have access to, uh, special secure devices and things like that. So, you know, it, it's just a question of open your mind to, hey, this is a new tool I have that I can use for all these applications. Medical is going to be big. Entertainment, of course, leads the way. Entertainment gaming, gaming will lead the way. And then everything else will follow. Right. So, uh, having read a little bit about your technology, uh, the compute and processing to process that data and then transcode that data in a format that can get out to distribution networks is small enough that it can get onto somebody's phone. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I imagine you have to carry around data centers with you everywhere you go, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, the, I don't know if it's in the trucks that you're referring to, but the amount of compute and process, because you're dealing with terabytes worth of data. That's why Intel smiles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you want to add this there? No, go ahead. Yeah. So when we did virtual, that, you, you hit on a very important part of it. When we did virtual reality way back when, a uh, lot of you remember who were with us in the journey, including Sriram and others who came to our lab and saw it. We had this half million dollar silicon graphics, uh, infinite reality computer uh, that I had, I had a $90,000 donation and then went to the dean for another 90000 and went to the provost for another 90000 went to my department head for a 45000 for <laughs> You know, you piece that together. I want a half million dollar computer in the lab, right? That drove one headset, you know, at a time. Now you take that, the memory that we got on that computer, 32 gigabytes of RAM for $32,000. Sorry, <laughs> not 32 gigabytes. One gigabyte of RAM for $32,000. We got two gigabytes of RAM for $64,000. You get two gigabytes of RAM on a phone, you throw that phone away saying, it's not a good phone, I want 64 <laughs> gigabytes of RAM. Right? So that is massive. The, the, the graphics that we had on those you know, cost $90,000 each. You get those for $37 in Walmart today, right? So the com the, how these things became commodities driven by gaming and media is really what allowed us to now get into this new virtual reality where in this small phone and this headset, you are able to process that. Now, on the other side, when you're pushing all this data out, we have um, servers in the truck that are taking all this data and they're compressing it and sending it out. For the volumetric data, the true view that Uma talked about, the, where we are getting all those terabytes of data per minute, we are not yet streaming live to people yet. There's a whole cloud infrastructure technology that's being put in place with partners to allow us to get to that stage before the next Olympics hits. Well, right? your technology was still like, I think, a <coughs> gigabyte an hour or something. Oh, I yeah. Mean, it's, oh, yeah. It's still a massive amount. It's still a massive amount, yeah. right. So, you know, that, that's all part of how you manage the data to get the best experience out and how do you compress it. Racks and racks of servers, we've got a lot of our own. And for ships. sure we have them in the trucks. And we're trying to move it to the cloud and then have a knock, the network operating center in Santa Clara in the Intel premise. This, this is a fun part. I define the product she has to implement. <laughs> 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 yes. And again, anybody needs to leave, we won't be offended. Please, I know it's past 4 o'clock, but yeah. but it's about a dystopian reality. And what do you think the dangers are with virtual reality? Mm -hmm. You know, I guess um, I, I, I remember we, we, there was some article we, we, we wrote about just VR and, you know, this kind of a question. And, and you know, I, I really think that the way we view it, that VR brings you closer to something you love. And that's, that's how we are going about this. Now, like anything else, right, like a camcorder or a, or a camera or anything, it can be used for other purposes. I, for one, definitely believe the real world is beautiful 
and I want to live in the real world. I don't want to be living in the headset even though I'm creating that because there's a place for it, but I want to spend most of my time in this beautiful world. So I really feel that these are things that you create for an entertainment, for a purpose, but you can't take it to an extreme and uh, you have to use your common sense and uh, you know make sure that just because you have a hammer everything's not a nail so just because you have vr doesn't mean everything has to be done in vr so it's a great that, question to, to add to that you know if you have seen the movie you know, the real world is where you can get a decent meal right that was one of the dialogues <laughs> in the movie we already saw the movie we knew that we better see it as soon as it's released because people will ask us questions in this presentation here so it was a deadline for us to see the movie before we came to pullman and yeah Advice on starting a company within a university. We don't have many success stories like you. So if you had to give a couple key things, I mean, what would they be? I'll let you go on this one. <laughs> uh, I think I'd rather do this one on one. <laughs> no, you, but, but essentially, I think the environment is uh, I, from what I hear is much more conducive now. I mean, because I think a lot of the uh, front runner, uh, what should I say, like, you know, universities that are more in, you know, in the media and so on, you, you, you hear that uh, universities are being judged based on how much research is getting commercialized and things like that, and that's a good thing. And so uh, I think that momentum is good. And I think if you ask for advice, I mean, I would like to say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm taking it from a different point of view. When you are starting, very, very often what happens is we fall in love with the problem and we fall in love with the solution. And we think everybody sees it, but people don't. And you have to be very uh, tough to be able to articulate that to the skeptics. And in some cases, take the right input, in some cases, truly believe that they don't know. And that doesn't mean you have to change every time somebody tells you something. And also, again, from a different point of view, one advice I would give to faculty members starting this, I think, again, coming back, we focus too much on the technology, which is correct. We need to, but we have to remember that ultimately, if, you're a, if your goal is either an exit or your goal is to go IPO or whatever it is, People in the real world, it is brutal when it comes to all your uh, cap structure, your legal paperwork, your financial documents. So keep each and every piece of paper. It was incredible 10 years of information we had to go digging in. And not that you do anything wrong, but you don't keep those that kind of paperwork and so on. So I may not be directly answering your question, but I wish I, was, I, wish I knew that people are going to be really judging you or, or whatever, the, 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 the valuation of your company is not just on your technology. And that's, a, that's like cold water to most of us engineers and, and, and scientists. But uh, if you have a messy company, peep, unless there's someone who, who's really in love with what you've done, 95% will not touch you with a 10-foot pole. So Advice number one, go for it. <laughs> okay, you, you know you you you'll regret not going for it more than you'll regret going for it, even if it doesn't work out. Number two, university provides a lot of support in terms of intellectual property, in terms of starting a business and so on. Take help. Uh, we f tend to feel as faculty that hey, I run my own little business in my research because I have managed my money, I manage my students, I manage their health benefits, I manage their tuition. I manage my projects, I can do it all. No, get help. Um, get, get people who know accounting, get people who know legal, get people who know how to set up companies. We think we know, and we are all very smart people in the university, but there are things that they have seen over years and years and years that they will pick out that you would never even see. Uh, so that experience, that let's not discount the value that um, legal, accounting, marketing, and sales brings to the table to add to the technology. Without any of those, it's still a piece of technology, it's not a business, it's not a commercial, commercially viable product. So my advice is number one, go for it, and number two, get help. <laughs> <laughs>
I think with that, um, so I think with that, we're going to take a break and, and say thank you to Jay and Uma, and then um, Mary. So may I just have one yeah, final go, thought? Please. You know, I just very formally again, I said a little bit at the beginning, but really, really want to appreciate our gratitude to WSU. Uh, we did start our careers here, and uh, just so so grateful. And I truly believe, I truly believe from the bottom of my heart uh, that we could not have done this if we were at any other university. And so uh, just the, the students, the, the energy, I really feel that we, if it was not VR, we would have done something else. We were just having so much fun doing it. And I think that's another message really that, uh, you know, thank you, thank you so much to WSU for all that they've done. Well, and I wanna, I wanna, put the thanks back. I want to thank both you <laughs> and Jay for coming today oh, and give you beautiful. another piece oh. of cougar, cougar love. Thank you. Here, thank we'll you. scoot over. Thank so. You. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Thank you so much. So take it home thank and, you, and share the love. Oh, and it's, it yes. means a lot for us and for the students. Um, we, we have a reception outside for pizza with the students. So if you have questions and we didn't get to you, yeah. I'm positive Jay and Uma will continue to, 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 yeah. to accept those. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. <laughs>